Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kees Bastmeijer. I'm a professor of nature conservation and water law at Tilburg University. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, that I was invited to have this uh, presentation for you. Uh, in Tilburg, we know this conference. Uh, colleagues of mine have been participants in the past, so we have a, a very warm connection to this symposium. And I hope that I can contribute to uh, um, the sharing of knowledge and uh, the valuable discussions. What I would like to do today is to build on earlier work on um, wilderness protection, in particular from a, from a legal perspective. Um, and I will also build on a um, recent article that I um, have developed together with David Tekex and Philippa McCormack and Benjamin Richardson. Um, in that article, which has been accepted for publication in Environmental Law uh, next year, we discuss uh, particularly one challenge, the management challenge of wilderness, and I will discuss that today as well. But before I start, I would like to say something about the definition of wilderness, because if I start to speak about wilderness, this is the first question I generally will get. What is wilderness in your perception? And you can, of course, take a subjective concept. Um, uh, for instance, wilderness is a place where you can experience wilderness or where you can experience solitude or remoteness. Um, and that definition has been used in the literature, uh, Roderick Nash, for instance, uh, but also many others. Um, and it is, is also uh, recognizable in policy documents and domestic laws. For instance, uh, the uh, possibility to experience solitude is part of the definition of wilderness in the uh, US Wilderness Act of 1964. You can also define wilderness as a real place, and that has been done, for instance, by the IUCN guidelines on uh, the management of protected areas, category 1b, but also in policy documents as well as in domestic laws. And if you compare those definitions, you will very often find at least three common uh, components of that description. Naturalness, native species and free functioning natural processes, not necessarily unchanged, but um, the ecosystem um, is a healthy and free functioning one. And developedness, the absence of roads, buildings, bridges, tracks, uh, power lines, etc., and other permanent proof of modern civil society. Uh, and relatively large size. And that size is also related to that naturalness, probably, because very often you have or you need a, a, a certain scale to have free functioning ecosystems. Uh, there might be um, uh, exceptions to that as well, for instance, small islands um, uh, that, uh, that are relatively wild or, or really wild and, and uh, free functioning, um, of course, in, in connection with the ocean, but not necessarily very large. You could also uh, state that uh, yeah, wilderness as a place for people to experience solitude or remoteness is such an important uh, aspect that it, it should be part of that definition. Uh, that is a, a choice, of course, some people uh, do that. Um, others say, no, this is particularly a, a very important value, but not necessarily a component of the definition. Um, I, I think that uh, for, for me, both uh, options are very acceptable. Before I um, start with the first challenge, the definition challenge, I would like to state that uh, wilderness has um, yeah, been criticized from different perspectives. Um, and many of these uh, crit uh, critics, critics and very important to debate. For instance, um, does it strengthen the human nature separation? Is wilderness placing um, people out of nature? Um, for instance, uh, in Inuktitut, the language of the uh, Inuit, uh, there is, uh, to my knowledge, no word for wilderness, for instance. These places are the homelands of people um, and not necessarily uh, something different. Um, it might also therefore be uh, considered as a Western concept, uh, a concept that is actually a product of scarcity. And we should particularly um, acknowledge uh, and um, uh, uh, not forget that uh, the first initiatives to protect wilderness has also resulted in violations of rights of indigenous people. And you may also have uh, other discussions, for instance, on, on uh, the question of his, uh, historic sites, whether these may be in, uh, in, in wilderness, yes or no. Uh, I have a particular view on these issues, but um, it's not the topic of today, because today I would like to connect the wilderness with the Anthropocene. And I would like to discuss 
four issues that I call Anthropocene challenges for wilderness uh, that may be of interest for you. Um, but I, I would like to stress that this is a Western concept that may not be interesting or relevant for, for all parts of the world. The definition challenge um, is for me the question, does the concept of wilderness make sense in the Anthropocene? If we see so many global effects of environmental pollution, environmental change, um, is that a, a useful concept still today? The value challenge is what are the values if we if we decide to continue to talk about uh, the, uh, the wilderness, what, what are wilderness values in the Anthropocene? And if we find uh, protection because of these values important, what um, uh, is the role of law in protecting wilderness today? And I will um, uh, focus on international law as well as domestic law and I will call that a legal protection challenge. And last but certainly not least, the question is, if you have wilderness uh, legislation and you aim to protect it, how do you manage it? Just non-intervention management that is characteristic for most wilderness um, uh, wildernesses, does that make sense in an Anthropocene where you have so many challenges from um, Anthropocene um, effects on these wildernesses? And I will conclude with an, a number of observations. I will use the uh, um, Anthropocene Working Group uh, definition for the Anthropocene, used to denote the present geological time interval in which many conditions and processes on Earth are profoundly altered by uh, human impact. The definition challenge. Um, yeah, you may challenge actually uh, the concept of wilderness in the Anthropocene based on the components of the definition. If you look at naturalness, you might say that there is no natural ecosystem left because of the spread of non-native species, the persistent organic pollutants that have been spread to currents of ocean and air in the polar regions and through climate change. You may also say that undevelopedness and relatively large size is extremely difficult if you look at the fragmentation of natural areas in the world. And if you see wilderness as a place for people to experience solitude, you might say that what many, uh, and you might ask the question, what if many people want to experience solitude in the same wilderness? Is that st uh, still uh, um, a wilderness experience? Uh, and then we can refer to the Antarctic, the previous season, the, the next season will be completely different, of course, but the previous season showing more than 75,000 tourists visiting the Antarctic. I think these questions are extremely valid and you might also see wilderness as a continuum. You might not need to find a, a sharp watershed between wilderness and non-wilderness, but also accept a certain scale of wildness. Um, and then, of course, parks and cities will not uh, be considered a, a wilderness. But you might say that those areas that are relatively wild, like the polar regions, uh, certain parts of that at least, um, certain parts of the Amazon uh, deserts, but also core zones in, in, in large national parks may be very close to um, uh, relatively pristine wildernesses. So on a scale from one or from zero to 10, they might get a, a 9.5. And if you take the critics um, so serious that you would not like to speak about wilderness anymore, the question is what will happen with these last very remote and, and relatively pristine areas. It might well be that there is no need anymore to, um, to, to talk about it and therefore also no need anymore to protect it. And um, it's my, particular, my, my personal perspective that that would be um, um, yeah, detrimental for quite some values that, that have been attract, uh, uh, attributed to wilderness. Um, so I, I like this uh, idea of a skill um, which makes um, it important uh, still to uh, determine what wilderness is, but not necessarily to disqualify all areas that have some impact of, of human beings. But that brings us uh, to the value discussion. But before we do that, it is um, also a way of um, being able to map wilderness. If we have a definition and we, we also um, uh, consider it valuable to, to speak about wilderness in the Anthropocene, we can also show maps of remaining wilderness and also the loss of wilderness. This is a map of 2016 showing that um, an area of the size of India has been lost uh, um, in uh, 
the period between 1993 and 2016, 9.6% .6 of all wildernesses uh, gone. Um, a more recent study shows that in 2013, 25% uh, of wilderness uh, at the terrestrial level was still um, uh, in the terrestrial environment was still left. But that between 2013 and 2020, 1.1 uh, million uh, square kilometers of wilderness, an area of the size of Mexico, um, has uh, um, been lost. If we then look at a, a very yeah wild continent, um, Antarctica, we can also show through mapping that um, a lot of wilderness is uh, actually uh, lost because of uh, increasing human footprint. This is a map uh, by Summerson and Tin um, showing that the visitation, but particularly also the infrastructure for um, scientific research is limiting um, the uh, Antarctic wilderness. And in a more recent study by Lahi and others um, published in Nature, um, it is shown that um, uh, if you take all the data since the discovery of Antarctica, of human visitation, then it is shown that less than one third of the Antarctic has never been visited by mankind. That is, of course, a very strict um, definition, an inviolate Antarctic wilderness definition as used in the article. Um, if you take um, the, the definition that we just used in the beginning of this presentation, almost um, or more than 99% of the Antarctic is still a wilderness. But it shows that the human footprint is increasing and that um, uh, human presence uh, has been um, clear, yeah, clearly marked in, in all parts of, of the world. If we ten, uh, then uh, take up the, the second value, the, the value uh, or the second challenge, the value challenge, um, we see that um, uh, uh, rich discussions take place about wilderness uh, in also uh, the Anthropocene. Um, and it's my um, uh, conviction that many people listening to this presentation have much more knowledge about this topic than I have. But what I've been reading about is, as a lawyer, um, it is clear to me that in the, in the Anthropocene, many wildernesses, uh, wilderness values that have been described in the literature will probably only increase in importance. Um, increasing scarcity of almost um, area may be problematic, particularly in the Anthropocene, where you want to know what is happening and you need uh, reference areas for that. Um, increasing demands for areas to experience solitude uh, may also be a, an important factor to value wilderness also in the Anthropocene. And of course, um, the wilderness has a very imp high importance for wilderness dependent species and habitat types. And um, uh, uh, provide important migration options for species to adapt to climate change. For instance, if we look at this study by Ward et al. Um, in 2020 published in uh, Nature Communication, we see that uh, just 10% of the global terrestrial protected area network is structurally connected via in, in intact land. Um, so that's um, uh, still a, a high degree of fragmentation. So wilderness may have an extremely important role to play in making migration possible for those species that require that to adapt to climate change. And of course, um, the CO2 storage is a very important function and value of old growth forests, wetlands and other types of wilderness as well. If we then consider um, the loss of wilderness, um, while we also acknowledge the value of wilderness, then the third challenge comes in, the legal protection challenge. Um, and at the international level, it must be stated that the roots uh, of international law are not particularly widely friendly, uh, not wilderness friendly. Um, and an example of that is the theory on territorial sovereignty claims. Uh, Emmerich de Vertel has explained that no nation has the right to appropriate to itself a country except for the purpose of making use of it and not of uh, hindering others from deriving advantage from it. So cultivation, population, exploitation, active use of land um, were very important to show that you had a territorial sovereignty claim on land. And that's quite similar to property law. If we take the example of the Spitsbergen Treaty of 1920, um, uh, in which uh, 
Svalbard was uh, designated as uh, or um, acknowledged as a territorial sovereignty area uh, ter ter in the territory of Norway, um, then it had also been to decide whether previous private property claims were uh, laid on the, uh, in the uh, area. Um, and one of the criteria that a commission that had to decide on that had to use was the extent to which the claimant or his predecessors in title have developed and exploited the land claim. So also in private property, you see that um, the active use of it um, is an important condition to occupy. And we can also recognize that from, uh, for instance, property uh, theories of John Locke and others. Also, the environmental law routes are not particularly wilderness friendly uh, because of the very strong uh, focus on sovereignty over natural resources, but also the uh, focus on balancing development and environmental protection, of course, very important. Uh, sustainability, also very important, but it um, has the tendency to um, focus on the balancing of interest. And the question is whether wilderness has space in their balancing of interest um, uh, uh, framework. Biodiversity, um, extremely important in international law and policy making, but very often in, in, it is um, uh, interpreted as uh, yeah, um, uh, protecting uh, particular species and habitat types. Um, and that's uh, very understandable because uh, that is very specific and may also result in very powerful legal instruments like Natura 2000 in Europe, um, but it might um, uh, limit the scope of nature protection and might actually forget about wilderness. And that has resulted in very little international lawmaking for wilderness. We have the Western Hemisphere Convention of 1940 for North America, uh, but in the literature that has been called a sleeping beauty. It's uh, from a wilderness perspective, a beautiful convention, but it is not uh, very active in, in terms of uh, conference of parties and implementation. The protocol of environmental protection um, is part of a very active uh, regime, the Antarctic Treaty System. Um, and in Article 3, it stated that wilderness values have to be taken into account when planning and conducting activities in the Antarctic. But again, if we then look at implementation, we see that the 29 consultative parties that jointly manage the Antarctic um, very often forget about wilderness. Uh, for instance, um, um, the countries have not been um, uh, successful, although they have uh, made many efforts, but not successful in preventing non-native species in introduction in the Antarctic. Uh, and also little attention is paid to wilderness in environmental impact assessment processes. Uh, no prohibitions of permanent facilities for tourism, no maximum visitor numbers, and also the number of uh, science bases have not been, has not been uh, kept. And all more, uh, already more than 110 uh, stations are present in the Antarctic. If we then uh, cons uh, consider domestic laws, um, now we know that international law in uh, protecting wilderness is, is uh, extremely weak. Um, it is good to see that some countries have very strong wilderness acts, at least from a wilderness perspective. Um, and one of the most uh, um, well-known example is the Wilderness Act of 1964 in the United States, establishing a national wilderness preservation system. Uh, 760 wilderness areas uh, in 44 states are part of that system and protected very um, uh, strictly, um, uh, for instance, uh, prohibiting economic activities as well as uh, the use of modern technology such as uh, motorized vehicles etc and uh, also exploitation of those areas. Similar acts uh, may be found in other countries like Australia not at the federal level because of competence divisions but at the state level New South Wales, uh, South Australia but also uh, um, other uh, states. And South Africa has, of course, uh, Article uh, 26 in the Protected Area Act uh, of uh, 57 of uh, 2003, under which uh, 28 uh, areas had been designated as wilderness in, in 2018. 
Um, there are also quite um, uh, many other examples of these wilderness acts, uh, generally using uh, similar definitions as used in the beginning of the presentation, and also generally uh, uh, prohibiting activities of exploitation and other activities that would um, yeah, be uh, significantly affecting or affecting the uh, um, uh, wilderness values of these areas. Europe is a little bit different. Um, in 2009, the European Parliament uh, expressed its strong support for strengthening <clears throat> of wilderness-related policy and, and, and measures. But if we look at domestic law, we only see three European countries that have uh, explicit wilderness legislation, Iceland, Norway and Finland. And if we look again at implementation level, then we see in Iceland a very limited act implementation. Most wilderness protection comes from a separate act for the Vatnajökull National Park. In Norway, um, the legislation that uh, uses wilderness explicitly is limited to Svalbard. Um, and in Finland, uh, the Wilderness Act is actually about balancing interests between Sami and wilderness. Very important, but that might result in activities that would be prohibited in um, other uh, uh, wilderness areas uh, in the world. Most countries uh, do have options for wilderness protection, but through other international uh, acknowledged uh, legal tools, uh, such uh, as natural parks, um, uh, natural reserves, the Sapno Fikniki in uh, um, uh, Russia and, and, for instance, Estonia, very important areas for wilderness protection, although the concept of wilderness is not explicitly used in, in many of these instances. And more recently, some countries uh, have adopted explicit wilderness policy to use these instruments to um, protect wilderness and to restore wilderness. For instance, uh, Germany that would like to have 2% wilderness in its territory in the short term. But overall, we have to conclude that in, in Europe, explicit wilderness uh, um, legislation is rare, uh, particularly because of uh, the focus on sustainability and biodiversity. And that is a result of uh, international lawmaking and EU lawmaking uh, that uh, determines in, in um, a very large extent the content of uh, domestic law in Europe. If we then go to the last challenge, um, the management challenge, that challenge is particularly relevant for those countries that have wilderness legislation. Does non-intervention management make sense is then the central question. And you might take a purist view um, um, and uh, focus on the untrammeled uh, concept of wilderness. So wilderness um, as um, something that is uh, knows best and that uh, hands off um, management uh, is fitted because um, nature should have the freedom to make its uh, own decisions. A risk of that purest view might be that you lose certain wilderness values. For, ex for instance, um, you might uh, see that in the Anthropocene um, the bushfires may be so large but also intense and so uh, repeating um, uh, that different from the past it may uh, destroy certain um, uh, values in those uh, wilderness areas. You may also have uh, extinction of species because uh, climate change requires them to uh, migrate while these migration options even in the big wildernesses um, are limited at a, at a certain uh, moment in time. <clears throat> and that uh, invites to a pragmatic view uh, and to uh, have um, yeah, also space for these kind of activities uh, and, and management measures. But that has a risk as well, uh, a risk of loss of wilderness uh, values, for instance, uh, wilderness as reference. If you take these measures, um, it might not be a reference uh, area um, to understand the Anthropocene and certain changes. It may also have unforeseen effect. So in making uh, uh, changes, you might have the risk that you uh, do not uh, oversee uh, the changes in the area. And a particular uh, relevant um, um, danger of having more space for management measures is that that space may also be used for other interests, social economic interests. And we have seen in Europe an example in, the, uh, in Poland in relation to the Bielowiski National Park that Poland wanted to have very large um, logging plans uh, for uh, fighting the bark beetle using climate change as an uh, excuse and the Court of Justice has not accepted that approach. 
And that means that you might take a, a view very close to purism, uh, but with certain, certain very um, 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 yeah, strict criteria for making uh, exceptions. Um, for instance, uh, exception criteria could then be, and that should be then cumulative requirements, is that there is a severe risk of significant loss of wilderness due to anthropocentric uh, influences. Uh, nature will not be able to solve the problem itself. Measures have large chance of effectiveness and limited risk of unforeseen effects. And monitoring is possible to, um, uh, um, without negative uh, wilderness impacts. And no misuse for uh, other interest um, has been um, assured. So these might be a, a number of criteria based on literature to uh, deal with that management challenge. And that brings me to the conclusion observations. Uh, I think uh, the definition challenge um, may be solved uh, if you accept uh, um, uh, wilderness uh, at different scales. And if you accept the value of uh, the most wild places left on earth. And that is the value challenge. And um, it seems that uh, many of the, uh, the values attributed to wilderness are in fact uh, increasing in the Anthropocene, which is an argument to strengthen wilderness protection. And that argument is uh, much more uh, larger and, and, and um, uh, important if you look at the current legal protection that is very weak at the international level but also at the domestic level in many parts of the world wilderness uh, law is uh, uh, missing and that may uh, be an argument to adopt explicitly policy under the international convention that exists to protect wilderness for the purposes of these conventions to adopt more domestic wilderness legislation and to strengthen wilderness law implementation and then the management challenge may be uh, solved by exchange of experience between wilderness areas management uh, experts uh, and um, on the basis of uh, the literature a number of those criteria may be uh, established. Thank you very much. Um, um, I hope this was useful for you. Um, it has been uh, um, much listening and I'm very much looking forward uh, to our uh, se section of, of uh, questions and discussion. Thank you very much.